So we spent a lot of time over there at the turtle and the eagle man, the elephant. We even got to go climb an etoy this time. Um, so now we're going over closer to Tucson to look at some of the old petroglyphs the Hohokam have left. Um, there's this really great blog I found that has already linked a lot of the petroglyphs here to um, petroglyphs that have been found in the Indus Valley. So, um, yeah, I'm going to come here and see what I can see up close on, um, on the pictures online. It's really hard to see them. So, since they're right here, I thought I could check them out myself. Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome again back to the Earth, our mud fossil Gaia. So, just exactly who is this trickster creator god? I could list over a thousand names and give a week-long presentation on just this guy alone, but someone has respectively already done that for me. So, if you haven't already, you really need to go check out um, Kirimio uh, Aho. <laughs> I'm probably totally butchering the name. Anyway, he will take you deep through the real native Amaru Khan story here. And to sum it all up for you, this is the lost continent of Mu, the motherland, the Mayak, or the first land to rise out of the ocean, which explains now why I found a scene from the ancient Hindu texts that happened right here. Um, Kirimio will break it down for you, but this is the land of the feathered serpents, and they migrated to India and other parts of the world from here. So, this is also the reason Praveen Mohan keeps finding so many similarities between the Nagas and the plumed serpents of the Mayas. Um, there's also a figure along with a labyrinth, Lingam, in a temple in India that he thinks doesn't fit. Um, and there's also um, th that labyrinth. It's, it was, um, it was an, it was a military formation that they used in the Mahabharata. And it's on the walls in the Indian temples. And then it's all over the petroglyphs here in America. That is Itoi's symbol. He is the man in that maze. So I wonder if there's any correlation there to that at all. So this book is American Indian Myths and Legends, selected and edited by Richard Erdos and Alfonso Ortiz. Okay. Here in the contents, they have so many stories of all the different Native American tribes here in the Americas. And, oh my. Okay, so there are so many variations to all of these stories that it gets really confusing, let me tell you, because some stories say Coyote created the world. Some stories say Itoi created the world. Some stories say it was Earth Doctor. Some say it was Buzzard. But I think what it comes down to is, um, well, when you look at the Hindu pantheon, it's all one. You've got, you know, so whether it was Coyote, Buzzard, or Itoi, they're all the same. I think we're dealing with the Trimurti force here. Um, so that's why, you know, one story said Coyote did it, another one said Etoy did it, and it's that way across all the stories. You know, it's like this tribe says this guy did it, but this tribe says that guy did it. And so who really did it? I think they all did it, right? So anyway, here in this book, there is a story. A Tale of Elder Brother. It's a Pima legend about Itoi. Itoi they also called Elder Brother. Itoi is this, well, I think it's Shiva, and he basically came back all pissed off because 
the three cities of Maya here, they were pretty much ran by the demons. They became extremely powerful and didn't give a shit about him anymore. They started treating him badly. And that's pretty much the same way the story goes in Hindu stories as well. But that's what Itoi says. He's like, you know, I created these people. I gave them all this power, taught them all this stuff. And now look at what they're doing to me. You know, I mean, he even had like an Apache medicine man put a bad spell on him. And um, the people that he created, they kept trying to kill him. And they could not kill him. Um, so they went to Buzzard. And Buzzard, he has many names. Anyway, he's his brother, basically. Actually, he's his older brother, but, you know, um, Itoi took the elder brother title on his own. And he created a miniature Earth to show the people, look, I have the same power he does. I can kill him for you. And so he did. He killed him. But being so powerful, he came back to life. He came back to life and he went around to all the four corners of the earth trying to find help to raise an army to come back here and wipe these people out for what they did to him. And that's what this story here is. A Tale of Elder Brother. You people desired to capture Elder Brother so that you might destroy him. So you went to Vulture. He made a miniature earth, shaping the mountains, routing the watercourses, and placing the trees. And in four days he completed his task. Mounting the zigzag ladders of his house, he flew forth and circled about until he saw Elder Brother. Vulture saw the blue flames issuing from Brother's heart and knew that he was invulnerable. In his turn, Elder Brother knew what had made the earth and wished to kill him. Elder Brother, as he regained consciousness, rose on his hands and feet and swayed unsteadily from side to side. He looked at the land about him, and at first it seemed barren waste. But as he recovered from his bewilderment, he saw the wonderful world Vulture had built. Looking about him, he saw a river toward the west, along which grew arrow bushes. From these, he cut four magic sticks. Placing he, his hand on, the, on these, he blew smoke over them, whereupon magic power shone forth from between his fingers. He was much pleased with this, and laughed softly to himself. He rubbed his magic bag of buckskin four times with each of the four sticks, and then put them in and tied it. Then with his strength fully recovered, Elder Brother began to move. He arose and crushed all mortal magicians, the orator, the warrior, the industrious, and the provident woman. He even ground his own house into the earth. Then he sank beneath the surface of the earth. He reappeared in the east, made a transparent trail back to the place where he had gone down. About the base of his mountains, the water began to seep forth. Entering, he came out with spirit refreshed. Taking all the waters, even those covered with plant, water plants, he dipped his hands in and made downward passes. Touching the large trees, he made downward sweeps with his hands. Going to the place where he had killed Eagle, he sat down looking like a ghost. A voice from the darkness asked, why are you here? He answered sadly, despite all that he had done for them, the people hated him. He went on to the east, renewing his powers four times at the place where the sun rises. He blew his hot breath upon the people, which like a weight held them where they were. It sounds like a dragon to me. He went along with the sun on his journey traveling along south border of the trail where there was a fringe of beads, feathers, strings of down and flowers. 
He jerked the string holding these so that they fell and made the mad and made the magicians jump. Later he did the same thing in the north. On his journey along the sun's orbit, Elder Brother came to Talking Tree. Why do you come like a ghost? asked Tree. He replied, Despite all I have done for the people, they hate me. Tree broke one of his middle branches and cut a notch around it to form a war club and gave it to him. Then Tree broke a branch on the south side and made a bundle of ceremonial sticks from it for him. He saw a trail toward the south and another toward the north, bordered, bordered with shells, feathers, down, and flowers, and he turned them all over. Arriving at the drinking place of the sun, he knelt down and saw a dark blue stone. He left there the sticks cut from the arrow bush, which he knew contained all his enemy's power. But he kept in his grasp the sticks from the sticks cut from talking tree. Toward the south were strewn necklaces, earrings, feathers, strings of down and flowers, all of which he jerked and threw face down. Toward the north, he threw down the same objects. As they struck the earth, the magicians jumped again. Reaching the place where the sun sets, he slid down four times before he reached the place where Earth Doctor lived. Why do you come looking like a ghost? asked the god. Despite all I have done for the people, they hate me, he answered. By Earth Doctor's order, the wind from the west caught him up and carried him far to the east, then brought him back and violently tossed him back down to the earth. The south wind carried him to the north. The east wind carried him to the west. The wind from the zenith carried him to the sky and all carelessly dropped him back down again. From his cigarette containing two kinds of roots, Earth Doctor blew smoke upon the breast of Elder Brother, whereupon green leaves sprang forth and he gained consciousness. Earth Doctor cleared the ground for a council and then picked up Elder Brother as he would have taken up a child and put him in his house. Earth Doctor sent Grey Gopher up through the earth to emerge in the east by the white water where lay the eagle tail. He came out by the black water where lay the raven, raven feathers. He came out by the blue water where lie the bluebird's feathers. He came out by the yellow water where lie the hawk's feathers. He found so many people that he feared they would not be conquered. But he gnawed the magic power of their leader until he weakened it. That sounds like Del Gied. I'll tell you the story about the hero twins later. Gopher did that. He did that to Del Gied. Okay, so, then he returned to the council in the netherworld, where his power as a magician was recognized, and he was placed on a mat with Elder Brother. The people were now ready to do whatever Elder Brother desired of them. Like fierce predatory animals, or birds of prey, they poured out of the underworld and fell upon the people of the upper world. Whom they conquered without difficulty. The victors swept property and everything relating to the conquered from the face of the earth. <sighs> Consider the magic power which abode with me, which is at your service. <sighs> That's scary. <clears throat> Can you imagine these Hohokam people who had these immense, beautiful cities here with canal systems that are still used today? They had these people just pour out of the underworld. <laughs> That's scary.
Sorry. That's intense. It's hard for me to read that. Think about what that would have been like. And it, it clearly says right here that his whole goal was to completely make them disappear. The victors swept the property and everything relating to the conquered from the face of the earth. Those were his orders. And then they didn't even they didn't even leave their name behind. We don't even know. Okay, if we dig, okay, I'm sure um, Kirimio has already broken that down, and we know the actual name of these poor people that were destroyed. But they gave him the name Hohokum, which means the people who were here before, or the people who are gone, or the people who are all used up. That's what that word means, and that's why they call them that. That's not who they are. They are not Hohokum. Um, they are the people who were here before, so I guess they are Hohokum. Technically, it's still definition, but that's just incredible. It's no wonder that we don't have a history of the people who were here before because there isn't any. It says in the history itself that they completely wiped it out. It's gone. But who is this person? I mean, he says right here, Consider the magic power with which abode with me and which is at your service. Who is this? Is this really? Because now, Elder Brother, the Mormon Church. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying the Mormon Church themselves, but there have been LDS members who claim that Elder Brother would have been Jesus Christ when he came here, which the Book of Mormon has all kinds of stories that sound just like this, actually. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I'm going to be digging into that as well, because, yeah, I think a lot of the, the devastation that we see, the, um, yeah, so, so, okay, here's one story. I just told you this one. I'm going to read to you from the Book of Mormon, from our elder brother in the Book of Mormon, okay? And then I'm going to read to you from another elder brother, who we would call Hermes Trismegistus, or Toth himself. Um, he says, he, he gives us the same story. Um, what happened in Atlantis, it is the same story they have here in America of what happened, the Great Flood here. It happened the same way. The same way. And then there's Gluskap, and then there's the, the beloved twain, the hero twins. The hero twins were told to let loose their lightning bolts. And just wait till I tell you that story. So the melted buildings thing, yeah, most of the mountains here, almost everything here, is something that was huge and beautiful before. It really truly is. And... Jesus will tell you in his own words that he left hills and valleys in the places of these cities so that we would never know of the corruption. He said he said he left mountains and valleys in place of the cities, so that we would never know of the corruption. Literally, that's Jesus' own words. He left mountains and valleys where there used to be cities, so that we would never know the corruption that those cities involved.
This right here is in Sri Lanka and they call it Ho Cobra Hood Cave and this is what that that structure there reminds me of. You can see some of the melted brick lines in the walls here also. And I'll show you an even better example of what I'm talking about when I say brick lines. Right here is a really good example of what I mean when I say brick lines. You can see right here that The lines over here match up with the block work right next to it, which tells me these were probably blocks that have been melted, and you'll see little pockets still of stone in there. And you'll see the same thing up in here. You can see block work still on the wall, and the lines just continue up the black charred melted stuff. And then it kind of marshmallows and puffs over the stuff that's still left there. So this is that, that website that I left a link for. Um, that has a lot of the comparisons and after looking at this indescript um, and then going and looking at some of the petroglyphs around here um, I found a lot a lot of them in the Hohokam art as well but these kind of things here I mean clearly clearly those are four armed humanoids on like lion type creatures. I mean, the similarities are, are too much. This one right here at the bottom I think is my favorite. So my whole reason for reading you that story is to emphasize the reason why the people who are here now cannot read the writing of the people who were here before. <laughs> so the, the Native Americans who are here, um, they didn't create these, it wasn't their ancestors. Um, even the, the Hopi, they say they were brought here um, by Kokopelli. Kokopelli brought them up from the underworld. Um, so there's your, your Kokopelli Itoi connection again. Um, Coco Pelli also has a song for everything, so does Itoi. Itoi has a song for everything. And, um, yeah, a lot of the, the villagers always had a problem with, um, his puberty ceremonies. Itoi, you know, Coco Pelli also, all the women would always get pregnant when he came around. Well, um, Itoi was notorious for the same thing. So, this, this petroglyph here, this, this is one of my favorite. This is clearly... A Shiva Lingam. Okay, Lingams are only associated with Shiva. They are, I mean, the, the whole story behind it, it's it's a it's Shiva's phallus, okay? <laughs> and so the only time you're gonna see a Lingam, it's for Shiva. So this that's what this is. These these are lingams, okay, and here's your standing right here and then it's got even the three lines like they usually have the three lines on it there and I think this um, this thing coming off his head th this is Shiva this is Shiva and that is the Ganja River um, that flows it actually he caught the river in his top knot um, another time he saved creation <laughs> So I've been seeing this guy all over petroglyphs everywhere. Um, I think this was before 
he transformed into Pashupati. Um, and then Pashupati, he's the horned god, right? But then there's also a lot of petroglyphs of lots of horned beings. And I think that's where we're seeing um, depictions of like the Mahabharata wars. You know, they all had horns on their heads. It was the gods and demons fighting for thousands of years. So, you know, the people who lived here before must have seen some of this. Um, this right here, this, um, this is a particular shape that is specific to the most ancient relics of the Nagas in India. If you watch Praveen Mohan at all, um, he he did, he, he went to um, this not even known site and found a statue of this shape and knew that it was a statue because of a site he was at before it correlated to the petroglyphs there that they claim those beings are Nagas. And so his question was, do the Nagas have wings? Because they, they really look like bird creatures here. Really curious. So I did go to a few petroglyph sites and I think I just got more frustrated than anything else because um, like Signal Hill, you can get right up to the petroglyphs but then they have this barrier that goes right around it and a lot of the petroglyphs are facing like the outside of the hill and you would have to actually climb out over the barrier and around the outside to go see the ones I was wanting to look at. And then um, another one, Honeybee Canyon, we tried to go to. And you have to walk a whole mile down um, a wash to get there. And little man, he is with us, and he couldn't make it that far. So, yeah, they make it really difficult. Like, all the other places around here are anywhere from a two hour to six hour hike one way and so you know I'm gonna have to really get a babysitter and plan to go see some of those but what I did do I got this really cool um, de-stretch app so the pictures that are online I can enhance them now and um, see what else I can see in these pictures so this is really fun to play around with Anyway, here in this petroglyph, oops, there are more shivalings. These little things up here, those are shivalings again. And then I think, I think these little guys that look like they've got, I don't know, it looks like four snake heads or something, like. I think those are uh, Nagas. That or it could be Brahma. You know, Brahma's got four heads or Trimurtis. I don't know. There's Shiva again with the little, with the ganja in his top knot, right? And then here's your snake charmer calling on the qu uh, calling on the Quetzal. And I love how these guys here are always flying, right? I guess back then. Uh, the, the horned mountain sheep could fly. Yeah, that's great. So, another thing I thought was really interesting, there's Cocopelli. There's Cocopelli again. Um, and then there's, there are, um, uh, there's a pattern of turtles, Shiva, and spirals, or serpents. Um, in a lot of these petroglyphs around here, you'll see like a series of turtles. And it made me wonder, because there's a whole other story um, where Native American tribes were led to a series of turtle islands, smaller turtle islands, they say, because they do believe that the Earth itself is Turtle Island. Um, but I was wondering, you know, they called them terrapin. And if they were churning this ocean for so long, you know, it was a dredging project. So it, you know, to dredge something, you're dragging the bottom of that ocean. So you move across that ocean. So they didn't just stay in one spot. They, they 
dredged the whole ocean, you know, looking for all these things they lost in their fights. And so within that amount of time, think about it, if you've got a mountain churning on the back of a turtle, what's going to happen to that turtle shell? It's going to wear out eventually, right? And the way these gods would play with these avatars, they would just, you know, toss it off and create a new one. It was a game to them. And so I wonder how many of these turtles they went through in this process. Uh, there's another really great petroglyph here. My friends from Tennessee who went through Arizona recently sent me a few pictures. And this one here, you've got the spirals, the turtles. And so it really makes me wonder, you know, like when I see this beam of light, like usually you'll see it on a pole. And um, so I wonder if that's representing like um, Indra. At first it was Vishnu that was on top of the wedge, balancing it as they churned. Then um, he had to incarnate. Hi, burning tree guy. Uh, into the turtle to support the mountain when it started to sink. So then someone else had to come replace him and sit on top of the wedge. And so when you see that beam of light, I wonder if that's what that represents. There's other pictures too. So many. There's Shiva again. And these guys look like they've got a mace. He looks like he's got four arms or one of them big horned hats like I showed you. Um, and a mace. He's got a mace. This other guy over here has a mace. So, interesting, right? Yeah. I'm not going to sit here and try to play with these toggles, um, not while I'm doing the video, but the main one I wanted to show you, it's up in um, Picture Rock, or not Picture Rocks, Painted Rocks, up by, up by Phoenix. Show you the one I enhanced. Okay. Right up here. I'm just going to get out my handy little pen. Now, the when we see the one, you know, the, the Shiva symbol, the one antennae, whatever, um, I think that represents Shiva. I think when you see two, that's Vishnu. And so this guy here, okay, he's got two on his head. And then there's this really weird spiral thing like underneath him, like he's transforming, okay. Um, this over here is something you'll see in the Indus Valley a lot too. Um, I think this is a dragon. I don't know. <laughs> it looks like a dragon. But what I was talking about with the pole, okay, we've got the, the wedge with the balancer on top. Well, Vishnu had to, when it started to sink, he had to come in and he transformed into the turtle underneath the wedge, right? So we've got this little, because I really just scribbled all over it. So we've got this little turtle thing right here underneath what looks like a axis. You know, it was a piece of the world axis. And then 
Uh, oh, this is also, this is a, a very common um, Indus symbol right here where they outline the cross like that. Um, and here's your dragon over here again. Now, I don't know if it's a dragon. They don't know what it is. It's an Indus, it's Indus script. Um, but up here, when we see these spirals, they represent serpents, okay? This one looks like it's coiled around something. On this end, there's a man holding on to it. And on this side, where there's probably the head or something, is another man holding on to it. I wonder if that represents, like, you know, you've got your, your demons and your gods on each side churning it. I don't know. That's what I see. They can't read it yet. They can't read it. They're trying. Um, they are using artificial intelligence now, actually, trying to crack the Indus script. Um, there's a few other people that claim they have already decoded it. Um, so I'm going to look into it a little more because if we can read Indus script, we can start to read these petroglyphs. How cool would that be? You know, these people saw some pretty amazing things. That I know. So what killed this dragon? Why is this dragon lying here now? The Hindu texts are extremely detailed and pretty explicit as to what happens in them. And it doesn't say anywhere that Shiva had to use a dragon avatar at that time. So I wonder if this, you know, it happened later. Like when I came to Arizona, one of the first stories I heard from a, an indigenous person here was um, I, I was talking about the giants and how they're all turned to stone and their mountains and stuff. Now she's like, oh wow, that's really cool because our god, Itoi, he's a mountain. He was killed by a giant bird or they, how they put it is, they fought. They, he fought a giant bird. He defeated the bird. He killed the bird, but then he lied down and went to sleep and never woke up. And his body <clears throat> became a mountain. And then he came back to life as um, a little old man, a little green old man, which is really interesting because there is an avatar of Shiva who they say is the immortal one, and he's green. So, when she told me that story, you know, I, I went digging and digging, trying to find more details, and I didn't realize until recently that that mountain she was talking about was this dragon, you know? So then I'm digging, digging, trying to find any correlation to dragons and the Tohono Odom people because their sacred mountain that is a dragon you know so it, they claim that to be their stone god and so they say it was a bird a giant bird and it was you know vulture buzzard he has a lot of names okay and I think it was another aspect of the same god like kind of basically they killed themselves sort of, I guess, right? <laughs> um, because the bird would have been an incarnation of Vishnu, and this Naga would have been Shiva. And there is a picture of him where he has a very dragon-like face that he's got lion flames like all around and looks very much like what this would have been. And at that time, when he was that avatar, it was to fight Vishnu, and Vishnu was a giant bird. So, our giant bird that killed this dragon, his name, the, to the Tohono Onam people, they call him Sawani. He was another medicine man with the same amount of powers he had, and I think I found him. I'm gonna have to give him his own video, okay? But the feathers on this guy, 
they glow like gold. They glimmer. They glimmer in the sun just like gold. They are gorgeous. Um, but I'm pretty sure now, after all this digging, that I think I found the culprit. So I'll be presenting him in a video of his own. I can't promise what's coming next. I have so many things that I'm behind on. Um, there are there are actually mountains that used to be buildings, okay? I have titans down by the gates of hell that are 5,000 feet tall. Where did they live? You know? So, it would have had to be a structure the size of a mountain. And since I found those titans, I've been searching for something they could fit in, and there just isn't one. Okay? But, I found some stories where it involves creatures and the melting of the cities. All in the same story, same paragraph. So, just wait till I tell you about the beloved Twain. And the true native Amarukan story here. Like, like, um, Curie Mayo. <laughs> I don't know if I say that right. The real Amaru Khan story here is way bigger and more magical than we have ever been led to believe. And it does not lie in the history, it lies in the mysteries. So stay tuned, hit that subscribe button, make sure the bell's ring in so that you can be informed of my next video. and. Yeah, I'll take you deep down some more rabbit holes. Okay, real quick. Before I go, I want to show you what I found on that bird. Okay? And I had already suspected before I even went to the mountain that it was a bird. And it's a bird that has melted buildings on it. That, that statue of whatever that is, that is on top of it. There was melted cities there. Um, probably melted by Shiva. You know? He was pissed. <laughs> but these, it's even the shape of a heart. I collect heart rats. So, check out that glimmer and those ripples. You see that ripple? How cool is that?